So we need to talk about devolution. Devolution, in short, is all that stuff involving Ruth Davidson, Nicola Sturgeon, the Scottish Parliament, Northern Irish Assembly, English votes for English laws. It's all that kind of stuff. And in this video, we can be learning um, about the origins of devolution, why it happened, a um, little bit of the history, how Scotland differs from Northern Ireland, differs from England, uh, looking at each region in turn, uh, talking about some of the successes, some of the failures, maybe where it's going in the future, and giving you a really good understanding about how it works and and how you and some examples that you can use in your um, exams so as always this is just a kind of an introduction to the topic hopefully a wonderfully detailed and fascinating introduction but you do need to go on and do some more reading on your own either in a challenging textbook or, or in the revision guide depending on your your time allocation so what exactly is devolution? Why, are we not, why do we not use the word federalism? Because in America, we use the word federalism and we talk about a federal system. But in the UK, we talk about a, a devolved system or a devolved power. What's the difference? Well, the key difference is this. Devolution transfers power, but not sovereignty to the various regions. So let's talk about America first. In America, you have the federal government and you have the state governments and the constitution gives sovereignty to both. Both of them are in charge of their relative um, bits. You know, the, the national government is in charge of foreign affairs and coining money, et cetera, et cetera. And the, and the states are in charge of what well, they're in charge of, you know, like, like the local police forces, et cetera, et cetera. They can't take the powers from one another. Neither of them is in charge. Um, they both kind of gain their sovereignty from the constitution, which is ultimately sovereign over everything else. Whereas in devolution, Power is given from one to the other, but the sovereignty never moves. So within the, in, the, the United Kingdom, the, the national government, which is the one in Westminster, has given some of its powers to the regional. So for example, it's given Scotland the power over education. It's given them power over some of their local health um, services. But sovereignty has never moved. So the, the Westminster Parliament will always be in charge of the Scottish Parliament and the Northern Irish Parliament. So powers have been given, perhaps loaned might be a better word because they can be taken back. Powers have been loaned out, but it never changes who or what is ultimately in charge. The second key difference, as I completely pressed the wrong button on my uh, power, and the second key difference is that it's unentrenched. Whereas, going back to the American example, Constitution has uh, very much entrenched the state's powers and the, and the existence of the state legislatures and the, uh, the existence of the federal government, and it would require a constitutional reform to change it. Devolution only exists by an act of parliament. So, in theory, the devolved parliaments could be taken away. And the Northern Ireland Parliament Assembly is currently not sitting. Um, and there used to be something which I've talked about in a previous video called the Greater London Council, which was also kind of undevolved. So they're unentrenched in the UK. The, the, these assemblies, in theory, could be um, dissolved, destroyed, taken back. Um, in reality, perhaps the use of referendums has entrenched them, like we've had a referendum to create the Scottish Parliament. Would we have to have a referendum again to kind of dissolve it? I don't know. Um, but it's certainly not legally entrenched, even though perhaps they might be politically um, entrenched. The other difference between um, a federal system and the devolved system is that they are asymmetrical. Now, symmetrical is when two things are exactly the same, and asymmetrical is when two things are different. Or, or on both sides. So for example, um, Texas and Florida in a symmetrical federal system have exactly the same powers. But Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland, all their assemblies and parliaments don't. In fact, one of them is a parliament and two of them are assemblies. So that shows you just from a start that this is an asymmetrical system where different assemblies are given different powers. And lastly, reserved powers. So there's this thing in America where constitutionally there was a battle about where powers belong. Did they belong to the federal government, the national government, or did they belong to the states? And there's something called the Bill of Rights. And number 10 in the Bill of Rights is called the reserved powers um, sentence, paragraph, I can't think of the word. Um, but basically what number 10 does, hence the X, is it says that any powers that aren't expressly given to the federal government are reserved to the states. 
So if it says the federal government can coin money, then they have that power. But if it doesn't say what, that they have it, then the states have that power. Now in devolution, it's the other way around. The, if, if something is explicitly given to the devolved parliaments, then they have that power. But if they are not, then that power belongs to the national government. So in short, in America, in a federal system, the powers are reserved to the states, the regions. But in um, a devolved system, the powers are reserved to the national government, um, which is the complete um, opposite. So there's our kind of difference between the difference between devolution and federalism and that came up as an exam question last year so it's good to make sure that you kind of know those differences because there's a lot of kind of keywords and terms there that you can kind of um, play with so why did devolution happen well broadly speaking it happened after 1997 and, and the tony blair government it was something that they had put in their manifesto that they planned to do and they were going to use referendums to make it happen but why what was the point the first one was a, a noble cause of democracy. They wanted to be able to give people more opportunity to vote, to have choices, um, because at that point, people got one vote once every five years on one MP in one local area that, whilst, of course, is democratic, it doesn't give a lot of choice and it doesn't give a lot of input and it doesn't give a lot of local control. So by increasing, by creating these additional parliaments, you're giving people more elections that they can vote in. You're giving more parliaments that can look after um, different uh, elements of the kind of communities. You've got uh, different accountability. You've got what's called more access points, which means there's more people that you can go and access, talk to, if you've got certain issues going on in your country or your neighbourhood or your or your kind of region. So it was about um, increasing the democratic nature of the United Kingdom. The other slightly more cynical um, aspect of devolution was the, the idea that it was trying to prevent nationalism. There was a growth of the SNP and a growth of national feeling in Scotland. And the thinking was that was by creating the Scottish Parliament, you'd kind of diffuse that nationalism because hopefully a lot of people would go, oh, right, well, we've got a Scottish Parliament now, so I don't need full independence. Now, the opposite actually ended up being true because the national parliament was successful more people said well hang on a minute if we can do make this work then why can't we have full independence but that was the goal in the uh, in in the short term was to try and re reduce nationalism now this one is unique just to northern ireland um peace now northern ireland really really struggled with terrorism and it did for a period of about 20 to 30 years um uh, including most famously the uh, the Brighton bomb. I'm just trying to get that um, screen to be a li li bit, a little bit less bobbly. Um, famously, the bomb that almost killed Margaret Thatcher um, in Brighton, I think it was, uh, the hotel that had that kind of huge kind of chasm down it, uh, was done by the IRA. And the IRA are a terrorist organization, um, or they would call themselves freedom fighters, that believe that Northern Ireland should rejoin Ireland and they should be a unified island. Um, there are other parties that want Northern Ireland very much to remain a part of the United Kingdom, like the DUP. And so one of the purposes behind the Northern Irish Assembly was to create peace. It was to give those people that wanted um, Ireland to be reunified, to kind of say, well, look, you've got your own control here over your own area, and also to kind of signal to the DUP that they were actually still part of the United Kingdom in some way. So it was kind of a compromise angle or part of a compromise. And um, the Good Friday Agreement, which I think was 1998, uh, was a famous agreement that was finished on Good Friday, where both the nationalists and the unionists agreed that they were going to share power in this northern Irish Assembly. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to um, the Northern Ireland section. But that was another one of the reasons um, for, for having it. And the last reason was because, well, local needs. By having a Scottish Parliament, a Scottish Parliament can do things and make laws and make policies that actually benefit just Scotland and the same in Wales and the same in Northern Ireland. The idea is that rather than having this big national government that has to kind of make a policy that benefits as many people as possible, but might leave out certain regions, a local regional parliament can make decisions and make policies that benefit just that area because Britain, the United Kingdom, is a big place. And what benefits the countryside in England isn't necessarily going to benefit the cities in Scotland. Or what benefits London is not going to be the same as what's in Northern Ireland. So it allows local needs to be addressed and looked after in a democratic way. 
seems doesn't seem like a bad idea. Um, but now what we're going to do is we're going to look at each one in turn, England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and talk about what they've got, what powers they've got, a little bit of history, a few examples, and you can kind of see that actually the, the story of devolution is actually quite complex, because unlike in the American system where you can just kind of say, well, here are the powers of devolution, uh, here are the powers of the, the, the state governments, in England, in, in England it varies from Scotland, from Scotland it varies from Wales. We've got a very unique devolved system where each bit has its own story, its own powers in a way. So England actually rejected its own parliament. Now, England has never as a whole had a referendum on it, but the North East was given a referendum and 77% of people said, no, we don't want one. We don't want any kind of local devolution. So it, it, it was kind of not really st a non-starter. There wasn't really a desire for it. The vote that they had didn't really want it. Um, and of course, England has its own parliament, which is the Westminster Parliament, which is also the national parliament but it's kind of seen as the english parliament and in fact it was the english parliament for many many years if you go back um historically to you know ancient kings and all those kind of things like the westminster parliament is the national and english parliament so there isn't that kind of big desire for a parliament in the same way so what's ended up happening is that devolution has been done through city devolution or mayors. Um, most famously, the London mayor, there was uh, Ken Livingstone and then Boris Johnson and now um, Sadiq Khan. So London has its own mayors, um, but so do other cities as well. And in a previous video, I was talking about how Andy Burnham is now the mayor of Manchester, I believe, and Liverpool has their own mayor and and, Bur and, and other ones as well. You know, they, 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 they're, they're kind of rolling out English devolution rather than saying, here is the English parliament. They're more kind of going, okay, so here's one for this city and here's one for that city and here's one for that city, putting in these kind of small um, assemblies instead. And like I talked about in the previous video, English votes for English laws. This is one of David Cameron's um, ideas where after the Scottish independence referendum, he said, well, we need to address what's called the West Lothian question. And I, I suggest you Google the West Lothian question, but, uh, but essentially it's uh, why is it that Scottish MPs can vote on English issues, but English MPs can't vote on Scottish issues? But Google it if you want a more kind of more uh, kind of clarification on it. But there's this kind of imbalance. And David Cameron said, well, we need to make sure that when when Westminster is voting on an English only issue, it needs to only be the English MPs that can actually kind of make that decision. And so EVEL, English Votes for English Laws, was created in 2015, uh, which is still pretty new. It's only been going for a few years. There haven't been many English Votes for English Laws. So we're still kind of like, well, has this been a success or not? But this is basically as far as English devolution has gone. Um, and it seems to be holding relatively steady. I think most people would say that the London Mayor um, project has been a success. They, they, they certainly have become internationally recognised figures. I mean, just look what Boris Johnson has gone on to do. Um, and in fact, the, it, is, uh, it is expanding with the recent addition of, of Birmingham and Liverpool and, and so on. And they've also started to increase the powers um, for these local areas as well, in line with some of the other devolved areas, such as giving them their own budgets to, to work with and even control over um, bits like bits of healthcare and things like that. Scottish devolution. Well, this is the big one. This is the the, the big uh, powers that were given away, devolved from Westminster. And um, it was mainly to try and combat nationalism. There's my uh, my Scotsman um, in, a, in a kilt. Um, and the idea was that by giving this parliament, then nationalism would kind of fade because they were given their own parliament. Or to put it another way, that the nationalism would be would be appeased. They would go, yes, we yes we have we, we have our own parliament in uh, in Edinburgh, and um, it seemed to start off reasonably well. The, the first government in Scotland was a Labour government under a man called Donald Dewar, who was one of the pictures I had right on the very first. Um, slide. But over time, the SNP began to get more and more control. Now, in all of the devolved assemblies, they have their own electoral system. And we haven't covered electoral systems yet, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. But 
In short, the Scottish Parliament was given a system whereby it was highly unlikely that one party would ever get overall control and you'd normally end up with a coalition of two or more parties together. However, the SNP became so popular in 2014, I think you might want to double, double check that one, that they actually got so many votes that despite this unusual electoral system, they got complete control, which is when Alex Salmond became First Minister and now, of course, we have Nicola Sturgeon as First Minister. So actually, now Nationalism has really risen um, under de devolution, leading, of course, to the independence referendum of 2014? I want to say 14. I want to say 14. Let's hope that was correct. Um, and significant powers have been given to Scotland and actually increasing powers. There have now been several acts that have given more and more powers to Scotland. And here is Alex Salmond, who was the First Minister, standing next to a rock that says, The rocks will melt with the sun before I allow tuition fees to be imposed on Scotland's students. So, if you live in Scotland, or you are Scottish, then you do not pay university tuition fees. Very key, useful example for you in your exam. And also, a real difference between the Parliament of England, if it exists, um, and what happens in Scotland. And they were given more powers after the um, Scottish independence referendum. It was part of the deal. Um, I, again, I talked about that in a previous video, but when, when Scotland rejected the independence referendum, referendum, part of the deal from David Cameron, Gordon Brown and, Nick, and Ed Miliband was to give yet more powers to the Scottish Parliament to enable them to uh, raise and lower taxes by a bigger amount, to allow them to, to control more elements of the uh, their own kind of health services and to do things with VAT receipts. Um, but independence is still a big issue in Scotland. Now, the, the, the independence referendum was 55% said no, which meant that about 45% said um, yes, um, which is pretty close. You've only got kind of like 5-10% kind of in that result. And the independence row uh, was supposed to go away. But it didn't, because the EU referendum, the Brexit referendum, has re reignited it. Um, there was a famous quote from Alex Salmond in the independence referendum, and he said, this referendum is, is a once-in-a-generation opportunity. So he, he was kind of saying, you know, if you don't vote for referendum now, then it's going to be 20, 30 years before you get, get another opportunity. Scotland decided to stay in, so it was widely thought that this was kind of a done issue. But then when Brexit happened... Most of England and Wales voted to leave the EU, but Scotland voted to stay by a large margin. And the argument now goes that, well, if you're taking Scotland out of the EU against its will, then shouldn't Scotland have the right to once again choose to be independent or to have that referendum? And the calls for another referendum have been coming and they, and they are strong. They're not like so strong that we're about to have one um, again, um, and part of the reasons to do that are political, and perhaps the and the SNP has been struggling in certain areas. But the independence debate has not gone away in Scotland, and the Brexit conversation has made that um, perhaps more likely than less likely. Welsh devolution is at the other end of the scale. It's an assembly not a parliament. It wasn't really very popular. Only a quarter of people, only a quarter of eligible voters in Wales voted for devolution. And you might be kind of thinking, well, hang on a minute, doesn't that mean more people voted against it? No. Um, 50, it was something like 50.5% of people that voted voted for it, but the turnout was ridiculously low. So actually, out of all the people that could have voted, only a quarter have actually voted for it. So it wasn't particularly popular. There wasn't a huge calling for it. And it only just squeaked over the line in the referendum. So they created a Welsh Assembly that had very limited powers, uh, couldn't create any of its own laws, and um, basically was kind of an administrative um, uh, institution really but over time again here the powers have increased we haven't seen the massive rise of nationalism like we have in scotland um but plaid uh Simrul, i might be pronouncing that terribly wrong um has gained some popularity but nothing like in scotland and over time um they have passed more and more powers to scotland including some of its own powers now to 
to pass various laws and to um, to play with uh, taxes and, and so on. So it may end up that we end up with a symmetrical devolution between Wales um, and, and Scotland, but we're not there yet. If you want specific examples of what they can and can't do, then do have a look at the textbooks. But the story here is definitely different from Scotland. It's less popular, it's less powerful, um, and there isn't that same nationalist um, feeling behind it. As I said earlier in the video, the Northern Ireland devolution is a different category altogether. It's far more based around the idea of peace than it is based around the idea of um, democracy or um, trying to prevent nationalism. It's more in a way trying to um, appease nationalism while appeasing unionism. Now, when I say unionism, what I mean is the belief that you should that Northern Ireland should remain part of the union of the United Kingdom and in Northern Ireland you have these two factions the Nationalist Party is often known as Sinn Féin although there are other minor parties as well and the Unionist Party is often uh, represented by the DUP although there are other there are other parties as well so this parliament very much came out of conflict. There was actually a devolved parliament before, um, from something like 1920 to the 1970s, but the conflict led to that parliament being dissolved. So remember, in devolution, powers can be given, but sovereignty is not given, and powers can be taken away. And that whole parliament was dissolved in the early 1970s, and many people thought it was gone for good, but over the Good Friday Agreement and the work of uh, subsequent Prime Ministers like John Major and then Tony Blair and with, 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 with help from various individuals, they came up with what was known as the power sharing arrangement. Now the two people I've got up there were at the time the leader of Sinn Féin, Martin McGuinness, who's on the far right, and you have Ian Paisley, who was at the time the head of the the DUP. And Northern Ireland has its own system that says that you have they have to power share. If one of them is the the first minister from say uh, the DUP, then the deputy first minister has to come from Sinn Fein. And if it goes the other way around then they have to swap over. So you can never get in Northern Ireland a situation where one party controls the whole thing because constitutionally the Northern Ireland Assembly has power sharing written in at its core which means if one of them refuses to take their seat in the power sharing assembly at stormont then the other one can't either which has led to it being dissolved and it's now although it was only created in the late 1990s it was dissolved in the early 2000s and then it was brought back and then it was dissolved again in late 2016 i think it is and it's currently as of the 29th of the 9th not sitting. This is uh, the, the, the assembly, it's in Stormont, and, and there's a handy little no entry sign at the bottom there, which is purely for traffic. However, it does very much make the point that currently no entry, it isn't sitting. This, this parliament, this devolution isn't working at the moment. Now we haven't seen a return to terrorism, thank goodness, but it's fragile. It's fra the, the situation here is fragile in a way that it hasn't been for 20 or so years. Um, and it's been made worse by the Brexit vote because you should be aware that there's a problem with what's known become known as the Northern Irish backstop. Because Northern Ireland is physically connected to Ireland, what happens when the rest of Britain leaves the EU? What happens in terms of the border? Do you have to put up a checkpoint? Do you have to stop goods moving across? What happens to freedom of movement of people and so on? Um, which is going to cause a problem because if they put up borders, then the nationalist parties will be very upset. And if they don't put up borders, then the EU and trade and perhaps the DUP would be very upset um, because then technically Northern Ireland would be treated different to the rest of the United Kingdom. So it's a fragile situation and and it's showing no signs of getting better um, anytime soon. And because of that, the powers that the Northern Ireland Assembly have been given have always been very limited. You know, it, I think the powers have been increased in Scotland and Wales because they have been proven, proven to be a success. And so more powers have been kind of given their way. The Northern Irish Assembly has proven itself perhaps not to be very responsible and therefore more powers haven't been given that way. But it's for very, very different reasons. Northern Ireland is definitely a unique situation. And in an essay, you could use that as a, uh, as, a as an argumentative point. You could say, look, this, this has been a a failure if you like or it isn't working but it is a unique situation it's not just that the the parliament has failed there are um uh circumstances here uh, known as the troubles which is 
what's what's causing the what's causing the problem wow i'm losing my words okay coming into land here so what difference has devolution actually made well quite a lot i mean let me, let me just read some of the uh uh, the uh, the differences out here because actually it's quite spectacular when when you look at it in a table um, it, you can see that depending on where you live in the United Kingdom there are quite significant differences between what's going on in Scotland I've already mentioned that you've got uh, no tuition fees you've also got a completely different government in charge so in Scotland you've got the SNP in charge of the National Assembly whereas all of the others it's uh, well, so in, in, in Wales, it's, it's labour at the moment. Um, also in Scotland, you've got personal care for the elderly is free, prescriptions are free, and there are some additional laws on things like fox hunting and things like that. If we pop over to Wales, free prescriptions, um, greater help for the homeless, um, and again, additional help has been given to the elderly. If we go over to Northern Ireland, then we've got more restrictions on social issues. So gay marriage is not recognised. There are greater restrictions on, on abortion. And again, prescriptions are free. Um, now, this shows you that although... You're not, you haven't got huge differences. Like in America, you can go from one state that has the death penalty to another state that doesn't have the death penalty. Huge differences. Uh, one state might legalize cannabis, another state might not legalize cannabis. Now, we're not at that stage yet, but there are differences in certain key policy areas between different parts of the United Kingdom. Has it been a success? Well, hopefully you could already answer that question because I'm just going to recap some of the ideas that we've gone through in the video here. In some ways, yes, it has. In other ways, we're still yet to see it. Although it's been going about 20 years, in, in constitutional terms, that isn't necessarily a huge amount of time. So has it been a success? Yes, we are still the UK. The Scottish independence referendum was, was rejected. There, there aren't huge calls from, from Northern Ireland and, and, and Wales to split the UK up. And, and generally, the, the parliament seem to be working and functioning and there is peace in northern ireland although the parliament isn't currently sitting we haven't seen a return to terrorism and sectarian violence and things like that also the powers have been increased over time rather than decreased over time so the fact that the more and more powers are now now budgets have been thrown that way is going to be seen as a success plus of course the the london mayors and the uk mayors and the the, the regional assemblies I and mean, these are all showing that um, this kind of regional um, democracy is is flourishing. And, like I said on the previous slide, there are now increasing differences between the policies and the laws in different places of the United Kingdom. Not up to the, to the point of the states in America are under a federal system, but there are increasing differences. But on the other hand, nationalism, especially in Scotland, has increased, not decreased. And you've also seen... Um, perhaps a, uh, a a rise of English nationalism as well, which perhaps has kind of been seen more in the kind of the Brexit vote. But nationalism um, hasn't gone away. And also there hasn't, people seem to be more, you can see this in demographics, that pe people seem to regard themselves as English rather than British or Scottish rather than British. Um, and there, were, there was an idea at one point that we should start competing in, in football as the United Kingdom rather than, uh, or Team GB, uh, rather than um, Scotland, England, Irish and Wales. And just little things like that to try and bring more a sense of unity and to kind of remove these cultural differences. But at the moment, you'd have to argue that devolution has not um, tackled nationalism. And I'm not saying nationalism is a, is a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just saying that it, it, devolution has not been a, a, has not ended nationalism. Also, turnout in regional elections are low. Uh, go, and, go and find a website and have a look at them, but they're, they're well below 50%. Um, although it has created celebrities or political celebrities of Nicola Sturgeon, Alex Salmon, um, Ruth Davidson, these are names that you will have heard of, but have you heard of the Welsh ones? And you've probably only heard of the Irish ones because of the, the DUP propping up Theresa May and things like that. So turnouts and, and the kind of the popularity of these parliaments varies from place to place. Lastly, Northern Ireland, sorry, thirdly, Northern Ireland, it's not currently sitting. You've got to put that in a different category and saying, and saying it's been a success because it's brought peace, but as a political institution for making decisions, it's not currently functioning because the... The, the two parties are currently refusing to work together. And you've got this unique situation where the English Parliament is the national parliament, 
but they don't have their own little English parliament. But maybe the counter-argument there is, well, now they've started to have the London mayor and the Birmingham mayor, so maybe that isn't a particularly strong argument. But sometimes it's nice to have an argument that's not particularly strong that you can put into an essay and then easily defeat. So, supposing the essay question comes up and says, to what extent has devolution been a success? What would you argue? Which side is stronger? Where's the killer argument? What examples would you use? How would you counter individual arguments? And ultimately, what would you conclude? Hope you found that video useful. If you liked it, then don't forget to like it. If I've made any mistakes or there's any other examples I can use, then do stick them in the comments section and I will see you soon. Goodbye.